Prepare-se para mergulhar no incrível universo de um mestre das artes gráficas e das histórias em quadrinhos. P. Craig Russell, o renomado escritor e ilustrador norte-americano, começou sua jornada nos quadrinhos em 1972. Ele se destacou com Amazing Adventure e a graphic novel Kill Raven, trazendo à vida o herói do futuro de H.J. Wells na Guerra dos Mundos. Uma parceria notável com Roy Thomas mudaria para sempre a vida de P. Craig Russell. Ele era apresentado a Eric e a sua adaptação do personagem de Michael Moorcock é uma das mais famosas do mercado. Ele também se destacou adaptando obras como óperas, incluindo O Anel de Nibelungo e A Flauta Mágica de Mozart. Suas colaborações com Neil Gaiman resultaram em trabalhos incríveis como Sandman, Coraline, Deuses Americanos e Norse Mythology. E agora é o momento que todos esperavam, uma entrevista exclusiva com a lenda P. Craig Russell. Aproveite, deixe seu comentário, uma curtida e compartilhe com os amigos. A gente se esbarra por este mundo. Deem boas-vindas a P. Craig Russell. Well, first of all, your work, I think, has its own style and personality, and uh, yet your drawings immediately remind me uh, of two visual styles. The Ligne Claire, the Claire line from the Franco-Belgian School of Comics, and also the Art Nouveau poster of Alphonse Mucha. Have uh, these styles somehow influenced in your work? And uh, if yes, how? Well, uh, certainly Mucha and the Art Nouveau uh, movement uh, had a great uh, uh, deal of influence on my work uh, and the French and Belgian symbolists uh, of the late 19th century, uh, wow. mostly for the subject matter, uh, the uh, just various ideas that they put into their work and, and the look of it, it seemed very applicable to fantasy, especially working on something like Elric. Uh, so that was an influence. Uh, the, the clear line style I didn't become aware of as, as, as a term as such, uh, until, I guess I would say, well into my career, but there's so much of comics that is simply uh, the clear line uh, style, uh, as opposed to, well, when Neil, uh, Neil Adams came along with his illustrative style, which was a complete change from uh, what you usually thought of, of what comic books looked like. Uh, so he, he spawned an entire school of um, I don't want to say imitators, but they just sort of took their cue from that style of drawing. But I was never, I never went in that direction. It was a clear line, very linear. So yes, you've got that right. Uh, okay, thank you. And uh, about uh, Moebius, do you know the work of Moebius, uh, Jean Giraud? Uh, oh, French. sure. Because <laughs> I, I, I see some similarities also, maybe. Uh, did you know his work in the 70s and 80s, or when did you uh, take contact with this, this French uh, expression? I would have become aware of Mobius in the early 70s, uh, certainly by the mid-70s. I came across an oversized uh, a book, uh, I think it was just, the, just called Gear or Gear, whichever. Yes. Uh, that was filled with drawings. I mean, it was really an oversized paper saddle stitch book. Uh, that and then, of course, when Heavy Metal, uh, the American edition of Metal Herlang came out, I uh, saw his work there. As uh, you wonder what what the difference is between inspiration and influence. Uh, there are a lot of artists I'm inspired by. First question. Uh, but he, of course, is very clear line, and um, uh, I'm always in awe at his facility that he could draw anything and seem to do it very quickly and, and beautifully. Uh, so he's up on Mount Everest for me. Uh, wonderful, wonderful artist. Craig, uh, as I told you, one of first jobs of yours, uh, I read was Eric. Uh, I yes. am a huge fan of Michael Moorcock works, and Moorcock is a base of the dark fantasy line of 
of, of story. Uh, yeah. He's one of the fundamental creators that make dark fantasy. And Eric is is a is a, a character he created with a, some of mockery of Conan. He's the opposite of Conan. Yes. Conan yeah. wants to be king. Eric is a prince and, yes. and such a thing. Recently, oh. Oh, uh, Cassiano is is, is showing. Yes. Recently, was released here in Brazil. Your Eric, your your adaptation of, of Michael Murkoff's Eric. Um, it, it's fantastic to see how you you capture the the essence, <laughs> the idea, the Murkoff put in, in his books and translated perfectly to to comics. Can you talk mm. a, a little? How is to to adapt a character from? <laughs> For a, a strong character from for a heavy and fantastic books to to that 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 your your language in, in comics well uh, it, it helped that so much of what I'd been doing already uh, and all of the things I was interested in like Doctor Strange and, and the symbolist artists was there in Moorcock's book in the settings and in the tone ironically I had never read Moorcock uh, until they asked me uh, to do The Dreaming City. Uh, when I grew up uh, in the Midwest, uh, the, uh, the books that were available, there was Edgar Rice Burroughs um, and uh, Robert E. Howard and H.P. Lovecraft, but uh, no Moorcock. I never came across it. And so in my teen years, in the 60s, I was reading all of that sort of fantasy. Um, and in the mid-70s, I was living in New York City, working at Marvel Comics, and people would ask me if, if something about Michael Moorcock. And when I told them I had never read him, they said, oh, you would love Michael Moorcock. Uh, and uh, so I hadn't read him until, um, I think it was Mike Friedrich, uh, who had the franchise at the time for the character, was putting together a volume, asked me to do The Dreaming City. So uh, I read it and said, yes, I would love to do this. Uh, the uh, <laughs> There's a wrinkle in there in that since I hadn't read the rest of the mythos, when I did a Dreaming City, which comes along in the third volume, he had no dis physical description of Elric's arch nemesis, Prince Yerkun. So I just made up the character for what I wanted to draw, which had fl he had flaming red hair, which is not what uh, <laughs> Moorcock described. So that's the one anomaly in, in that book. I like the fact that he was sort of, a, you would say, neurasthenic, the, the depressive character, the antithesis of Conan, certainly, and uh, was somewhat easier to draw. Because he's wearing a costume, he's, you're not looking at, at the virtual naked anatomy of a superhero or a barbarian kind of thing. And again, those settings uh, just lend itself perfectly uh, to the casting of spells where Art Nouveau design works so well. Uh, and I had a tremendous time doing it, and it really lit a fire while I was working on it, and I just worked on it you know, seven days a week, and actually did the coloring on the original artwork, uh, which is always a bit of a hair-raising experience to do. Uh, <laughs> because if you make a mistake, uh, you either learn how to work around it or start over. Um, and so, and then Marvel Comics, when they came out with it in, you know, uh, the edition, did a beautiful job with the reproduction of the art. So that was uh, rewarding. It was uh, this 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 edition you, you said that the Dreaming City was released here in Brazil a long time ago. It was of the first batch of graphic novel that was being released here. We uh, people know comics are children's books or superheroes, yeah. and just a sudden we have a lot uh, a lot of comic of uh, graphic novels. In Dreaming City was one of these. In this 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 wave of great comic novels, graphic novels here in Brazil, a lot of of fans and readers of my age, uh, not not so young, remember this. Oh, 
look at this uh, the, uh, the new paper strand this fantastic art who is this guy but this fantastic guy with a sword uh, uh, I, I i want it i, I really want it. it it's certainly like for Kana. i don't know but i want it because it was people are not used to have this kind of art in comics we know you work uh, at, at marvels making some some inking and you work with Q Raven, that character from War of War, yeah. if I'm not yes. yeah, uh, wrong. And you have your distinct style. Uh, and this is fantastic because you are one of the guys who make people say, okay, I can do this in comics. I can make something different from superheroes. I can make this in fantasy. Uh, people say this to you. Do, do you have, a, 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 do, you, do you see these? Where, where, that you have make so such an influence in, in another comic artist or in a line of comic artists? Well, it's happened a number of times that people have told me that um, when they were teenagers, uh, and that could have been you know a few years after I did this or many years after that, that they spent a lot of time copying the drawings, uh, which is a great way to learn. Uh, I, I did copies of Steve Ditko. Uh, when I was a teenager, or Al Williamson, I wanted to draw like that. And it's, it's a good way of training wheels, but yeah, that was the one, I think because of the imagery itself, uh, tied into a lot of what they liked about fantasy, and so would, you know, just simply copy the work. So I know it's had some influence on the especially aspiring young artists. And how does it feel? <laughs> well, it's, it's certainly nice to see. Uh, uh, when I mentioned training wheels, uh, especially when you're starting out, uh, you're, you're looking at other artists a lot. And sometimes even copying their drawings, maybe trying to disguise it or flip it around or put different clothes on. But I have a little stack of, of comics where I will be leafing through and see one of my drawings, you know, in the backgrounds or the foregrounds, whatever. Uh, and I, I, I say them. I'm, I'm flattered by it because I certainly can't say you shouldn't steal my work because I stole all kinds of artists' work when I was starting. Uh, yeah. I, I, I strongly believe I has a poster of Eric from Christos Achilles. I strongly believe that Christos Achilles copied your art. <laughs> I strongly believe. Okay? Yeah. Well, I saw, I think it was a Marvel calendar or pinup book once. And um, I forget who the character was, but the backgrounds had waterfalls and trees and rocks and there were like a dozen of my drawings all sort of compiled <laughs> into this one background i couldn't have been more tickled i was just picking them out as to hey, where they came from look i drew this <laughs> yes okay. that's right that's right <laughs> <laughs> and when when did you start uh thinking uh in the beginning now i'm not just following a other people's steps and but I'm finding myself I'm seeing myself in my drawing when did you start feeling this in your drawing well I think when I was working on Kill Raven I did 10 issues of that over a two-year period and that's a very formative period uh, it was you know the first three years uh, uh, working um, at this and if you follow it through those issues almost every single issue looks a bit different from the other one as I was just uh, trying different styles or just evolving into different uh, styles, learning how to uh, work with models. That's when I started uh, asking friends to pose for the characters rather than going through a stack of John Buscema uh, comic books and looking at his figure work. I started working from life so it would have a little more originality to it. Um, I, I think that's where it began. It's hard to describe when uh, how a style evolves. It's just like if you look at your handwriting over 30 or 40 years, that will ch slowly change and evolve. Uh, it's not a conscious thing. But the more you draw uh, and get away from influences, the more your own voice will come out. Um, God would say that was pretty much it. Talking about uh, drawing from life, from photographies and, and this, I, I think there are two, two things that are very interesting in your work to me. One is the style of the drawing, of course, and the other is the storytelling, the, the how the, the, the pages build. It's not just about the style of the, the lines. 
and right. uh, and uh, what were your influence on the, this storytelling on building the, the page breaking down the stories to the well page? you'll hear this this anecdote from almost every artist of my same age give or take a few years uh, I grew up in comics uh, that you know reading Carl Barks Donald Duck and then moving on to Archie comics and then Marvel comics at the very beginning um, but I, and I knew all of that and you sort of just absorb the way of telling stories with pictures but in the mid 60s Harvey comics came out with two giant sized comics they called them for 25 cents that reprinted Will Eisner's spirit stories. I think seven or eight of those stories in each issue. And that was an absolute revelation that uh, you could uh, evoke an emotion by changing the size of a panel. Uh, there, there's a, the, the story of Sand Seref um, in which she's murdered at the end on stage and uh, the, the spirit sees that she's dead and steps in front of the curtain and pulls it behind him. And what Eisner does in that last panel is to make that picture much smaller, do it in gray tones and leave this giant white nothingness all around it. And, and all of a sudden it becomes very quiet and tragic just by changing uh, the size of the negative space, the size of the image, draining color out of it. So that started... Uh, me on, you know, looking towards those kind of um, structures uh, as, as storytelling and then the, becoming aware not too long after of Bernie Krigstein's uh, experiments in graphic storytelling. That I saw I, also a giant. And, 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 um, and Steranko with all of his, his innovations when he came, he was only in his mid-twenties or so uh, when he was doing those. And I, I think beyond that, just a natural um, aptitude for uh, uh, telling stories. And, and in designing the page, what I, what I drew most when I was in middle school, I, I guess, I've always been fascinated by blueprints of our architectural designs, the floor plans. And that's what I would just spend hours and hours drawing floor plans of, of houses that's just sort of imaginary houses. They're always one story, uh, but there would be a lounge, a den, a library, a study, <laughs> every kind of uh, mm -hmm. thing there could be. And that was a, a, an exercise in arranging rectangles, arranging spaces, because as soon as you put this room over here and you wanted this, well, now you don't have enough space here. So what do you do to manage that? And it became uh, wow. knowingly a, a real a training uh, I even, my ambition when I was a, a child was to be an architect. Of course, then I finally, I realized that math was involved. <laughs> so I went into pictures <laughs> instead. Uh, but I still had a love for that and I love drawing, you know, fantastical buildings. Uh, but I think that was part of it. And uh, even as I talked about the styles, your style of drawing changes over the years. So does, you know, your style of laying out a page. It was a little more standard in the beginning. I loved the three-tier uh, design. Uh, you know, Eisner used that, you know, most of the time. Storanko did that. And a lot of the Kill Raven is, is like that. But as I moved on, um, a lot of Japanese influence came in, the Japanese architecture, and, which is very linear and, and, and right angles. Uh, and when I did the Dream Hunters years later, uh, Neil Gaiman's Sandman Japanese Fairy Tale, uh, I already had a number of books of Japanese art, but I went out to the Chicago Art Museum and bought a stack of them for reference. And um, I, it came, yes, right, there it is. Um, uh, I, I started doing the thing with that and with Coraline, in which I would have one basically large panel on the page and a, a lot of smaller ones. And that design looked very Japanese to me. And ever since, that's informed uh, the way I lay out a page. That uh, I mean, sometimes there will be, you, you only do it for a specific uh, storytelling point. Occasionally, I'll have just six same size panels on a page, but there's always going to be a reason for that. Um, either monotony, uh, or in the middle of the Ring of the Nibelung, uh, where I 
hardly ever used the three-tier page. I had a like a five-page sequence where these three characters are plotting uh, Siegfried's demise, and it's all three tiers um, and with a checkerboard floor, like they're planning this chess game. Very rigid that way, and only when Siegfried's horn is heard does the um, makeup in relation to the panels uh, break up again, as uh, as does the color. Uh, so I usually have a reason for anything that is standard. Uh, and uh, th this influence of architecture, did you study architecture? No. What was your uh, graduation, though? Is no. such a thing? No, I, I knew by uh, high school that uh, okay. that wasn't going to be. But uh, oddly, when I, my freshman year in college, in a dormitory, it was all architecture architecture students and me. I was the only <laughs> fine arts student there. And, uh, you know, for architects, by their sophomore year, there's maybe 20% of them left. And it's when they realize that math isn't their strong suit either. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, my best friend in college was, was an architect. And uh, so I'm, and I'm still sort of up on who who the architects are, and, and, and I love that. Uh, and of course, the architecture of the, the late 19th century uh, and the Art Nouveau influences on that. And uh, a pivotal moment when I was a teenager, the Wits End magazine uh, came out that Wally Wood put out. And that was the first time I think I saw Al Williamson and Roy Crankle uh, working together on those fantastical cities which have their uh, provenance from the drawings of Franklin Booth in the 1920s, some of those uh, high-rising, uh, just these beautiful sort of Greco-Roman Art Nouveau <laughs> towers put together. So there's a whole um, sort of uh, ancestry of that going on. 